This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For God has shown thee what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. This Sunday in April at Rankin Chapel was always special because Mr. Vernon Jordan would deliver the message. And we are dedicating this service in his memory. Mr. Jordan would often say that Dean Evans Crawford and I subpoenaed him to this pulpit. As though that were the case, Every year he would bring his family and friends as witnesses for the defense as he stood behind this very pulpit. He loved the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel with head and heart. He openly expressed this love. We remember him saying to us, we come to Rankin Chapel to nourish our souls, to quiet the storm, to find sustenance, healing, and even a moment of peace. Rankin Chapel is my home church away from home. Rankin Chapel is a part of me. It helped shape who I am and what I believe, and it sustains me in dark moments, lifts up my spirit, and inspires me to keep on keeping on. By the grace of God, every year since 1992, Mr. Jordan's powerful and eloquent voice would ring throughout the chapel, doing for us what he said Rankin Chapel did for him. 
his preaching sustained us, lifted our spirits, and encouraged us. I loved him and will miss his guidance, his support, and his deep love for this chapel. It is fitting that the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, will be delivering the message on this Vernon Jordan Sunday at Rankin Chapel. Mr. Jordan was chair of the search committee that selected Dr. Frederick to be the 17th president of Howard University. I know personally how proud he was of the leadership of President Frederick. I am equally certain that Mr. Jordan would want President Frederick to stand in this pulpit on this special Sunday. We give thanks for the life and the legacy of Mr. Vernon Jordan, and we give thanks for President Rain Frederick for his support of this chapel. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know it is the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. That is how I have felt every time I have walked into this chapel sat in these pews and stood where I stand this morning. It has been my privilege to worship here since 19, September 1957, nearly 59 years. When I was a first year student at the Howard University School of Law. In that time, I heard from this hallowed pulpit the words of great preachers, Benjamin Mays, Vernon Johns, Martin Luther King Jr., Howard Thurman, Mordecai Johnson, Gardner, Calvin Taylor, Otis Moss Jr., to name a few. Rankin Chapel has been the source of our strength, the sustenance and succor we need to heal the wounds, prepare for the battle, and continue the march. Rankin Chapel is where we come when our textbooks don't have the answers. There is a book here at Rankin that does. Talking about Lord, I done done. Lord, I done done. Lord, I done done. Well, I done done what you told me to do. Well, you told me to sing and I done that too. Well, I done done what you told me to do. I said you told me to pray and I done that too. I done done what you told me to do. Talking about the Lord, I done done. Lord, I done done. Lord, I done done. Well, I done done what you told me to do. Well, you told me to teach and I done that too. Well, I done done what you told me to do. I said you told me to preach and I done that too. Well, I, I done done what you told me to do. Talk about the Lord, I done done. Lord, I done done. Lord, I done done. Well, I, I done done what you told me to do. Well, you told me to shout and I done that too. Well, I, I done done what you told me to do. I said you told me to Good morning, my name is Danielle Holly Walker and I'm the Dean of Howard University School of Law. I give you greetings on this beautiful Sunday morning and welcome everyone to this Rankin Chapel 
Sunday. Every year in April, Howard University School of Law celebrates Law Day at the chapel and Howard Law faculty, students, alumni and staff come together for chapel service to celebrate our year of accomplishments and to thank the Howard University community for your support of the law school. Each year, this day is made especially important by a sermon that is typically given by one of our most distinguished alumni, Vernon Jordan. We are still grieving and are deeply saddened by the passing of Mr. Jordan, and we are here this Sunday to have a tribute to Mr. Jordan, and we look forward to the words of Dr. Frederick as he plays tribute to his mentor and one of the most important Howard University alums and former trustee members, Mr. Vernon Jordan. I was especially thrilled and touched by the work that Mr. Jordan always did on behalf of Howard University School of Law. When I arrived in 2014, Mr. Jordan welcomed me warmly and everywhere I went in the city of Washington, DC, someone would say that Mr. Jordan had been championing the work of Howard Law and all of the things that we do to make our law school so outstanding. In his annual chapel sermons, Mr. Jordan would talk about what inspired him to come into the law and what it meant for lawyers to be true change agents, positive change agents in our society. And the way that his faith, his deep abiding faith gave him the strength and also the perseverance to overcome so many challenges and become a world renowned champion for justice. We are thankful for the life of Vernon Jordan and we celebrate his accomplishments and his commitment to his family, to Howard University, and to all of the many lawyers and people of the world that he touched and that he lifted up during his lifetime. May each of you have a blessed Sunday and we celebrate with all of you, even though we are far apart, we are together in spirit. Thank you. When I can't see what's in front of me And I can't see what's behind But Lord, I know that every step you is pulling me deeper, deeper in the light. So I let go of my uncertainty and grab hold. And the waves will bring me safely to the land Cause you, you are the light that's shining down Shining down Oh, you, you are the light that's shining down And even in the darkest
week's scripture is taken from John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 and it reads see what love the Lord has given us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know God beloved we are God's children now what we will be has not yet been revealed what we do know is this when God is revealed we will be like God for we will see God as God is. And all who have this hope in God purify themselves, just as God is pure. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Let us be still before our God. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He pitied every groan. 
as long as I live and trouble rise, I'll hasten to his throne. Most gracious and loving God, before any human hands touched us, you already knew us. You are closer to us than our own thoughts. You know us, and still you love us. Your love is stronger than our weaknesses, and your compassion is greater than our guilt. And this is why we come to you, O oh God, for your heart is gentle and humble, and in your presence our souls find rest. As we center ourselves in you, we let go of our worries, our planning, our desires, and we lay our troubles aside. For you know our every need and every desire. You can feel our feelings. So we pause to let your spirit search us, O oh God, to search us so that we may know our own hearts to know what we really want, to know what we should walk away from and what we should run towards in this moment. We could even put our desires on hold while being comforted and reassured by your healing spirit. Come now, O oh God, and let your spirit find our hurting places. Let it heal the hurt from what is past and what cannot be changed. Let it heal us of always judging ourselves from being too hard on ourselves and from always needing to prove ourselves. And then help us, oh God. Help us to be more gentle with ourselves, to love ourselves so that we might love others. It is so hard to be gentle with others when we are hard on ourselves. And when we're unable to make sense of what is happening within us and around us. When black lives are being taken by those who are supposed to protect them. While this pandemic is ravaging our communities and when there are those who are plotting to take us back to a way of life that is against life. Even amid all of this, help us to understand that when we allow ourselves to be still and to find rest in your spirit and seek to live, move, and have our being in you, we will find the strength, the wisdom, the courage to face and overcome whatever will come our way and whoever stands in our way. Now resting in your spirit, oh God, we're going to let go of our doubts and fears. We're going to believe that all will work out for our good. And we're going to trust you. We are just going to trust you. Drop now thy still deuce of quietness until all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and the stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. In your name we pray. Amen.
Dean Richardson, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. It is always a privilege and an honor to deliver the Sunday sermon at Rankin Chapel. However, on this Sunday morning in particular, it is an honor that I would rather see bestowed on another, another who for so many years would provide me with counsel and guidance, counsel that I may not have sought, but whose guidance I always needed. While I'm grateful for the invitation to speak today, I'd prefer to listen, to listen to a man who is soft-spoken and kind-hearted and certainly full of wisdom. As we approach the end of another school year and what I hope are the final throes of what has been a devastating global pandemic, it is an auspicious occasion to gather as a community and convey our vision for the future. But I wish that another person could be here in my place to share his reflections on this moment in history on this Sunday morning at Rankin Chapel. That other person is not any other person but one man in particular who I know has been on the minds of many of us these past few months. I was referring, of course, to Vernon E. Jordan, Jr. For many years, this Sunday in April had been reserved for Mr. Jordan to deliver the sermon at Rankin Chapel. While I had the tremendous privilege of being able to talk with Mr. Jordan on a regular basis, I would always look forward to opportunities such as these to hear him speak. In every place he entered, Mr. Jordan exuded supreme confidence and comfort. His presence was always commanding, but even a man of his towering stature seemed to rise up when he ascended to the pulpit at Rankin Chapel. When Mr. Jordan stood to speak, it felt like an honor to be able to simply sit and listen. Today I am but a poor substitute. I stand before you saddened anew at Mr. Jordan's recent passing. At this critical juncture when our country stands on the precipice of a new era, we would all benefit tremendously from Mr. Jordan's fresh eloquence and insights rather than the echo of his past words and wisdom. Mr. Jordan's death represents a loss and it is important that we recognize it as such. He lost his life, his family lost their patriarch, and Howard University lost one of the tallest and sturdiest pillars. A nation lost an icon. But within our power is the ability to mitigate this loss and to lessen it. We can remember his guidance so that he can continue to guide us. We may carry his torch so that his life's work does not end with the end of his life. We must honor his legacy so that it may continue to burn brighter and brighter as years pass since his passing. We are duty bound to make meaning from the loss of Vernon Jordan. We have to remember all that he stood for so that we may stand up for it ourselves. Today through the sermon, one that I would prefer to defer as I said, but which I recognize that I must deliver, I would have us remember Vernon E. Jordan. By remembering the man he was, we can learn how to respond to the moment we're in and ensure that the future we make is one that he would have been proud to see. On this particular stage, standing in Mr. Jordan's vast shadow that has been cast by the enormity of his absence, I'm called to remember the words of Moses when God commanded him to demand the release of the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. The book of Exodus, chapter 4, verse 10. Please, O Lord, I have never been a man of words, either in times past or now that you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Moses was cognizant of the injustice being perpetrated on the Israelites. He knew that the world needed changing and that he was uniquely positioned to change it. But still, he felt inadequate to the duties he was being charged to fulfill. In this biblical story, I see two of Mr. Jordan's most timeless lessons. First, we must do our best with the responsibilities we have been given, even if we do not believe ourselves to be the best person for the job. And second, no one gets to decide what our mission is in life solely by ourselves. That is something that each of us must choose for ourselves. From a certain vantage point, these two lessons could be seen as contradictory. How can we both choose our missions and accept responsibilities that others choose for us? But when seen through the eyes of Mr. Jordan, I think we will see how perfectly complementary they are. Mr. Jordan, better than anyone I've known, understood his purpose in life, even if others never seemed to be able to. What he did and how he was and can be difficult to capture. He was a man who defied quick summaries and simple descriptions. He was a lawyer, civil rights icon, the executive director of the National Urban League, 
but he was much more than any of these individual titles or descriptors could ever convey. There were those who implored him to run for office or accept a political position. He always said no. Those positions would have deferred him from his purpose in a way that these individuals could never understand. There's a quote I've heard before. I'm unaware of its author or its origin, but I believe that it captures a core tenet of Mr. Jordan's beliefs. Power is subject to division, whereas influence can only be multiplied. Mr. Jordan always chose influence over power. There were those who encouraged Mr. Jordan to seek greater power, believing in good faith that he had the skill and the temperament to wield it well. And no doubt he did, and he probably would have. But he understood that the moment you choose power, they are forces to seek to take some of your power from you, dividing your total power until you're left with a smaller and smaller portion than what you started with. On the other hand, Mr. Jordan's influence would always expand by multitudes. He constantly sought to inflate his orbit from people whom he believed had potential to do good in the world. By increasing that influence, he understood that he could magnify his impact. He knew that he could do more by influencing others and empowering them to act. In our society, we would all be better served if people in politics were more tempted by influence and power. Today's politicians are more interested in the machinations by which they can obtain power and hold on to it rather than the ways in which they can cultivate their influence and increase affinity for their ideas. That is why so many politicians rise and fall, but Mr. Jordan always maintained his relevance. He saw the world differently than other people. He understood his unique mission in life, and in his pursuit of it, he would not be deterred. Mr. Jordan was an unparalleled mover and shaker, a chess player who cared just as much for the pieces he moved as the ultimate goals he moved them for. He never caused people to act by force or guile, but with love and truth. He earned the ears of so many world leaders and individual men and women by first offering his own. I am proud and humbled to see myself as one of Mr. Jordan's chess pieces. The week of his death, I often found myself thinking of him in the office of the president of Howard University, an office I occupy because of him. Mr. Jordan would often say that he chaired the search committee that named me the 17th president of Howard University. But his role was much more instrumental than that. The Howard presidency was not a position I ever envisioned for myself but one that he said was befitting of me. In the end, he persuaded me not to see myself as the best person for the job, but to remember that, as a triple alumnus of Howard University, I had incurred a great debt to my alma mater, and this was the best way to repay it. Mr. Jordan understood my personal mission, perhaps even better than I knew it myself, and he helped me understand that in the course of pursuing our missions, we come to take on certain responsibilities that we might not have anticipated. Both Mr. Jordan and I came to Howard for a reason. Howard was seemingly a means to an end, the path by which we would receive the education needed to launch and pursue our careers. But in the course of taking from Howard all that it could give us, we accepted responsibility for giving back to the university. We cannot simply draw water from a well, Mr. Jordan would teach me. We have to refill it so others might drop their buckets and also find water from which they may drink. Mr. Jordan helped me see the fullness of my mission. He helped me understand that we all must take an expansive view of our purpose in life. I could not just be a cancer surgeon whose mission was to help one patient at a time. That would not be in keeping with the social justice orientation of this great institution that trained me. My mission, by necessity, had to include efforts to improve the system in which I operated. I had to work to reduce healthcare inequities and improve healthcare access for under-resourced communities. And I had to call attention to injustices and work to correct them. Those were part of my mission too. And I could ill afford to try and accomplish those gargantuan tasks by myself. The responsibilities that I incurred opened new avenues to pursue that mission. By working to strengthen and support my alma mater, I could play a part in the development and cultivation of a new generation of leaders, individuals whom I could help guide and steer toward finding their missions, many of which would be compatible and overlapping with my own. Our personal missions are not individual undertakings. 
They are communal efforts in which we each play a singular role. When Moses told God that he did not wish to be the one to speak because of the slowness of his tongue, he was not neglecting his mission, nor was he abdicating his responsibilities. He merely wished to do the good he was being called forward to pursue in a manner that was better suited to his skills. As a result, Moses' brother Aaron became the spokesperson for and the communicator to the Israelite people. Moses was the leader, guiding his people ever onward toward the promised land. Their personal missions became intertwined. One could not fulfill his purpose without the other. As it says in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 6 to 8, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does act of mercy with cheerfulness. There's much in our world that needs changing. Any work that is worth doing requires a diversity of individuals to champion the cause, but we cannot allow the collective nature of this work detract from us finding our personal missions. Each and every one of us has a responsibility to discover what part of the world we are destined to change and how we are going to change it. However, we should always be receptive to counsel and guidance, feedback and criticism, especially if one such as Vernon Jordan chooses to bestow it upon us. We should let people in on the purpose we are trying to achieve and seek out external perspectives on how we can go about achieving it. But we should not dogmatically follow the opinions of others if and after due diligence and attentive processing, we disagree with them. I agreed to become Howard's president because Mr. Jordan convinced me that it was the right thing to do for myself, for my mission, and for my community. Mr. Jordan, however, did not run for office or accept a political position because he understood that those offices would have detracted from his mission rather than furthering it. We have to seek out other opinions, but we must have the confidence to reject them if they are wrong and the humility to accept them when they are right. As it says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 11, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he, has, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. In coming to accept the good that each of us can personally do in the world, also comes the ability to recognize the good that others can do too. We have to both believe that we can change the world, but not allow ourselves to believe that we are more important than anyone else. It is a balance between hubris and humility. And the way that we must strike that balance is by recognizing humanity in ourselves and others. We, each and every one of us, are all human. We all have missions and a purpose. We all have faults and flaws. We all deserve the opportunity to stretch our wings and see how far we can fly. And we all deserve to have a place where we can land to rest and reset when we become weary. Some place or someone who will catch us when we fall. More than any other lesson Mr. Jordan taught us to recognize the humanity in every person. It is a lesson that the coronavirus pandemic has devastatingly reinforced. We can ill afford to overlook or ignore the humanity in the people around us. Our grocery store workers, our healthcare workers, our bus drivers, and metro train operators, they are all people who have humanity that deserve recognition and elevation. In a world in which we are connected, it is absolutely vital that we see each other's humanity. As we each work to change the world, we must have an abiding belief that the world is capable of change. Mr. Jordan certainly believed this to be true. He was a man of America, an individual who saw the pits of its degradation as well as the beauty of its potential. He was raised in an Atlanta housing project in the segregated South and survived an assassination attempt by an individual motivated by racial hatred. From such humble beginnings, he would rise to the trappings of greatness. 
He would golf with presidents and sit in the halls of the White House. But he never forgot where he came from or for what purpose he had risen to such great heights. No matter how high he climbed, he would always reach back to pull others forward. He saw the best in people and helped position them so they could do the most good with what they had to offer. Mr. Jordan was always giving of himself. He left parts of himself behind in so many different parts of our society. He gave of himself to Howard, to his law firm, to his family, to businesses and organizations he served. He gave and gave and kept on giving. And yet, he only ever seemed to go larger, to become a more imposing presence the more he gave of himself. He taught us that in order to grow, we must give and give indiscriminately because each person is deserving of whatever we can give them. Mr. Jordan would make time for U.S. presidents the same as he would make time for prospective Harvard students that he would encounter on the street. Mr. Jordan saw all people as equal, not necessarily in what they had to give, but in what he had to give them. Finally, I would call on each of us to again remember Vernon Jordan. We must remember him actively, not passively. We should not wait for external cues to trigger us to remember one of his lessons. We should not wait to be reminded of something that he taught. We must orient our lives around that memory and around our personal remembrance of him. When we encounter other people, we should remember Vernon Jordan so that we might see their humanity and give them something of ourselves. When we think of the institutions like Howard University and Rankin Chapel that have given so much to us, we should remember Vernon Jordan and think about what he might be able to give back. When we encounter a fork in the road and contemplate which way to go, we should remember of Vernon Jordan and pursue the path that aligns with our mission and our purpose, our duties and responsibilities to ourselves, to others, and to the community. In that way, we might carry on his legacy and perhaps cultivate one of our own that aligns with his mission. Amen, and thank you again for the opportunity and for the things that we all should be so very grateful for, for the life of Vernon E. Jordan.
What a powerful message. Though the physical doors of the chapel are closed, the chapel remains open and vibrant as we continue to support the entire Howard University community. In order to support the ministry of the chapel, please visit our website, chapel.howard.edu. There you will find a give link. And during this time of uncertainty, never forget the power of prayer. You may submit prayer requests via the chapel website as well. We are incredibly excited to invite organizations to submit calls to chapel via the chapel website. Join us tomorrow at 8 p.m. for another installment of our communal conversation series. In Communal Conversations, HBC Royalty, you'll hear from Howard University Royal Court members as they discuss what it takes to lead and serve on all fronts. Communal Conversations can be viewed live on all of our social media platforms. To stay current on all things Chapel, follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with the handle at Howard U Chapel. Take a moment now to subscribe to our YouTube page and like us on Facebook. Lastly, Wherever you're worshiping with us, share your experience using the hashtag Sundays are for Chapel. We now welcome Dean Richardson, who will lead us in our benediction. We thank you, President Frederick, for that very powerful and moving message. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. We thank you, O oh God, for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. We thank you for the life and the legacy of Mr. Vernon Jordan. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And he replied to me, go out into the darkness, go out into the unknown, but put your hand in the hand of God and God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.